Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 34 of Teach Tech Play. I'm Eleni Karitzis, and I'm the host and founder of Teach Tech Play. Today, we've got a fantastic episode for our October episode of episode 34, and we're excited to have some fantastic educators from Australia. I can say Australia now because, Emily, I know you've got some news, um, and New Zealand. But before we get started with today's show, I'm going to say hello to Steve, my co-host, and then shoot over to our presenters to introduce themselves as well. Hello, Eleni. I'm back. I missed the last episode. I have been unwell for about a month, so I'm, I'm super stoked to be, a, to be alive and to be back on the show for what looks to be a really, really good episode. And I must say, you missed probably one of my favourite episodes last month. It was like bang, bang, bang of ideas. So I know I've implemented many of them already and I'm excited for what I can learn today to take back to my classroom because I'm not sharing anything today, which is nice when you get to sit back and let everyone else do the work. But before I just introduce everyone, just a reminder that you can jump onto the Teach Tech Play website um, and you can vote for your favourite presenter as well as, um, I've just lost my screen, sorry guys, um, as well as checking out our conference for next year as well. So Emily, I know you're on tonight's show and you are one of our keynote speakers next year. So I might shoot over to you if you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do. Okay, great. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, my name's Emily. I am a Canadian who uh, has not lived in Canada for a few years. I've been bouncing around the international world, uh, most recently in Singapore for the last four years, where I've been an education technology coach. Um, and I've just moved to Australia in the last month and uh, very excited to be moving to Melbourne very soon to, to take up a role in there. Yes, we're very excited to have you in Melbourne, Emily. I know we know each other from the online world and it's going to be great to finally meet you in person. I've heard that you're very tall. I am six feet. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I didn't realize that I'm like five foot. So it'll be interesting when we meet each other. <laughs> But it's great to have you on tonight's show and I'm really excited to hear your keynote at the conference next year. We've Thanks also got Mark um, from New Zealand. So Mark, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us what you do and where you're from. Do you want to unmute yourself, Mark? Are you there? Am I on now? Am I, yes. am I talking now? Excellent, thank you. I was just going to say, rookie mistake. Um, you can kind of tell that because I'm sitting in the dark, I'm actually the bottom of New Zealand. So I'm living in a place called Southland, which is the last stop before you hit Antarctica. And I used to be a teacher, and now I'm um, working with using technology better as a technology coach. Fantastic, Mark. And I had the pleasure of meeting you in January, and we've had some fun stories and experiences along the way. And I'm excited to hear about STEM tools, which ones, because I know this is an area you're extremely passionate about. Um, we've also got Steve Crow joining us today. So do you want to introduce everyone and tell us where you're from, what you do? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, like I said, my name's Steve Crow. I'm from a school called Pearsdale Primary School. I live on the Mornington Peninsula. And I'm a leading teacher here. Um, work with the grade fives and sixes, do a little bit of coaching, but heading up digital technology uh, across the school. So uh, it's been pretty exciting this year in a new role, trying to head it all up and get everyone involved and really passionate about uh, getting it happening with all the students here. Perfect. And we're very privileged to have you here to share gamification tonight. Um, next, we've got Adrian Cam, who is somebody who I've known for from the Twitter world, but had the privilege of hanging out with at ISTE. And um, I'm so delighted to have you on the show, even though you probably should be at home with your wife and your newborn baby. So do you want to tell us a little bit about your role, Adrian, and what you'll be sharing tonight? Yeah, thanks, Eleni. Um, you actually might notice that I've got a hoodie on. So uh, my wife and I had a, a baby girl, Aria Rose, two weeks ago. So I did duck home early today and uh, change out of the, the work clothes. So um, at home, all's well and um, excited to be here. Uh, my name is Adrian Cam. I'm the Director of Teaching and Learning at the Geelong College, which is an independent um, day and boarding school, about 1,500 kids. My role encompasses curriculum, teaching and learning and professional learning from early learning all the way through to year 12. So that's me. Perfect. And thank you for joining us all as well today. 
So we'll kick off the show and Mark, you're actually up first. So let me know when you're ready and I will start the timer. All right, sure thing. Okay, I'll just screen share. Okay, so I think I'm ready, ready to go. I'll start the timer. Excellent. So my, my background is as a teacher uh, in a primary school when I was the deputy principal there. And I started to get a little bit more involved in the, the digital learning stuff. And then now that I'm working for using technology better, my role has actually moved into the STEAM lead trainer. And I work with a lot of teachers in schools, um, helping them get their heads around STEM or STEAM learning. Uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things about this sort of role is I'm working a lot with resellers who are looking to obviously push a lot of product into schools. They're really keen to develop relationships with schools. And then I'm hearing from schools a lot saying that they're often being approached by people saying, you know, um, what tool should we buy? Um, you know, people are trying to sell us a whole lot of gear. And one of the, the, the great things that I do in the workshops that we have is we get to trial a whole lot of different tools. I don't know if you've seen some of these tools before. You, uh, they're pretty common in schools these days. These are what we use in the workshops when we're working with teachers. And you'll see that there's a, there's a lot more than that. It's just a, a little sample. One of the big questions that teachers are having is uh, they're coming to us and saying, you know, I've, I've got a thousand dollar grant or my principal's given me 10 grand. Some, I've even heard of schools having, you know, 20, 30, $40,000 to spend on gear. What do I buy? And uh, the number of times I've heard horror stories about people buying things, um, you know, and, not, and having a little bit of buyer's remorse, uh, that can be quite common. But there's some things that people are looking for. One of the things that um, obviously you're always thinking is how do I get the best outcomes for my students? So this is Michael Follin's work around the six C's. So we've all heard of the four C's, but I like the character education and citizenship. And that's all really good. Like you're kind of looking at technology, you're thinking which tools am I gonna buy? This is what I'm trying to aim for. It doesn't really give you much of a, a handle on, on which ones to use. So you're also thinking, um, I want my students to be creating. Everybody's seen Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, when you're thinking about STEAM tools, you're also thinking, okay, which tools are going to help me create, evaluate, and then sort of go down to understanding as well. Well, one of the, one of the things that we've put together is um, something that's going to, I think, help people. Now, there are five different criteria that I suggest to teachers. Uh, is something that can help them make a really good decision. Number one, you want it to be completely robust, so you don't want something that's going to break really easily, um, particularly in younger children's hands, but even, you know, as the, um, students get a little bit older, they can get a little bit um, quick to move through things. They get <laughs> slightly impatient and things can break. The second one there is cost, and, and I talk about cost effectiveness. Um, don't know, you don't always go for the cheapest tool, but you don't always go for the most expensive, and what's the one that's going to get you the, the biggest bang for your buck? Third one is scalability, and I suggest that teachers look at something that they can use with lower ability students all the way up to upper ability. So you're not just looking for something in the middle, um, something that has a range, so you get more um, bang for your buck out of that. The fourth one, one is modular. what modularity is just like, what can I attach to it? Can I be creative with it? Is it just got a single use, or can I be a little bit more creative? And then there's reliability. Does it actually go most of the time? Because a lot of the things, if they're attaching with Bluetooth or, you know, um, sound cords and things, they can be a little bit of a drama to get going. So the, the tool that we've put together, and you can download that with the, uh, the link at the top there, just has a little bit of a web tool. You can um, highlight the different tools down the bottom. Those are some suggestions. Add your own ones. And then here's an example of what they could look like. So for Makey Makey, for example, you're plotting it across. You're looking for the tool that's got the biggest scope. Um, across there. So once you got that, um, hopefully that'll give you a little bit more of a plug. Do I get to plug uh, these things a little bit more after my four minutes, Aleni, or have yes. I done now? Yes, Excellent. you do. You got That's cool. The buzzer's <laughs> going to go off now. There you go. That's cool. Um, so one thing, one thing that we've got going is we've got a STEAM Ready program. Um, and this is where we're working with schools over a period of time. And there's a, a list of different things that you can um, access through that. So we're, we're looking to partner up with the school. We don't want to just run workshops with teachers. We want to be able to um, help them uh, cover a systematic, a systematic kind of a process and look at their STEAM readiness. And we've developed these nine building blocks. It's based on 
uh, Apple's eight elements for success, and we've included the curriculum one there because with the digital technologies curriculum that's coming out across Australia and New Zealand, teachers are looking for help plotting how they're going to uh, meet those curriculum links. And then the other two workshops which are going great guns at the moment are these two, STEAM 1 and STEAM 2, where we unpack a lot of these uh, different um, sort of STEAM learning approaches. And my whole aim with this is not just to get teachers hands on with the tools, but to kind of show them the pedagogy behind it um, and how they can actually integrate it in their classroom and, and let them have some thinking time with that too. So if people are keen, there's a few little pictures there, you kind of see some of the tools in use. People are interested, they can contact me on Twitter um, and marketusingtechnologybetter.com. Keen to talk, and I was just in Melbourne and Sydney recently, so um, I hope I wasn't just down the road from you, <laughs> Lenny, you never know, you could tell me off as well. Uh, you, you, you probably were, but no, I know that you've been doing some wonderful work with schools around STEM, and I know that a lot of schools are seeing the new digital technologies and not knowing where to start, and I can say on the weekend I was at an event and that same question is, I've got this budget, what do I spend it on? And it's funny, I haven't been in that position to spend the money, so I always suggest you guys because you are the experts at knowing that and setting schools up for success. But does anyone else have any questions or comments for Mark? I do, Mark. Mark, what's your favourite of the, on the list that you, that you share? I've, I've seen you with Spiros and paddling pools, and I'm just going to leave that one there. But of the ones that you have mentioned on your list, what's your favourite? I've just started to get into make block and that whole range of, you know, MBOTs and MBOT ranges. And I've just been teed up with a, a workshop in New Zealand in Christchurch that's coming up uh, where there's um, an environmental institute who are getting some students to come in and have a look at the, the Antarctic environment and then how they would create um, a robotic tool that could meet the demands of that kind of environment. And that's going to be pretty exciting. I'm looking forward to that. So the, I don't know if you have you seen the inbots with the they've got tracks on there. I mean, I haven't un unpacked the box yet. That's it's in the mail apparently. Um, but that's that's like if I was going to plot that on that graph, that would probably have the widest one apart from the Sphero at the moment. Um, yeah, but, I love but, the popularity I mean, I, of it to be able to kind of go. Here's what it does as a core, but then to be able to add all the extra bits because then it just goes in so many different directions. Yeah, being a, I, I think that's the key. Once you tick all those other boxes, you're looking for something that you can be create, creative as you can with. But I mean, the key thing is the tool is only as good as the teacher who's using it. So I've seen, you know, um, a tool that you probably think would rate quite lowly, but in the hands of a really good teacher who knows what they're doing and knows their students really well, uh, you can just run some incredible stuff. So yeah, it doesn't always come down to the tool. It always starts with that relationship with the teacher. Yeah, for sure. Any other comments or questions? I uh, just wanted to say, I think it's a really great graph that you've got there. Just so often teachers go off to conferences and they find this tool that they think they just have to have in their school, but they don't have to do a lot of thinking about it before they um, put it forward to administration. Um, so it's really great to just get people thinking about what, um, about the tool from a, different, a bunch of different perspectives. And like you said, um, the pedagogy side as well. Yeah, yeah that's I, a huge one. Yeah, sorry. That, that's sorry. what we, Sorry, that's right. This is what we start our workshops with. We always, I spend about 45 minutes talking about, you know, pedagogy with teachers and going into that. That's, that's sort of a, a thing that I'm quite into. And the classic one is you always hear those horror stories. I heard one the other day from a reseller about a 3D printer and he was saying that the number of times he's, he's you know, heard of principals or somebody buying a 3D printer and they end up in his office with some really nice sort of 3D printed parts next to it and that's as far as it gets. Um, that happens a lot. So... I think the more teachers can be having conversations and trialing things and getting them into their rooms and that kind of thing, I think the better. Yeah. It's, it's, if it didn't make you laugh, it would make you cry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mark. And thank you for sharing. Next up is my co-host, co-host Steve. And I haven't, I haven't heard, heard you present you. in a while. So it's, I'm looking forward to it. It's been a while. I've been saving this one and uh, having seen the lineups for the past few months, I'm glad that I hadn't presented. But I'm going to kick off with just a little introduction because I know that there are many in the education world who've started a blog. And one of the key things that gets in the way of actually being able to do something about that is continually adding to it. And so the tool that I'm going to share is, is building a habit of writing so that you're able to be able to create a lot of content and be able to, to, to use that 
as a reflection tool, be able to use that to write presentations. So the tool that I'm going to share is called 750 Words. And I'm going to be a bit cheeky this week, Eleni, because I'm just going to throw a couple of things in there. So the, word, the website that I'm going to share is called 750words.com. Very, very simply, it is you write 750 words every day. And you'll notice up here that you have a streak and you notice that I did miss a day here. But what it gets you to do is to just sit and write. So every morning I get up and I write. So at the moment I'm writing a presentation and you can see there are times when something flows, there are times when it doesn't. But what I like about the fact is that I sit there and I do it every day and then if I go at the end of my month, I can come up down here and export it. So to give you a bit of a, a gauge, here's when I started. So it, since April 2017, I've written 100,000 words, which for me, I had done 50 blog posts in about three years. I've done 25 in that period. So you can export it. So if I export my August one just like that, comes up as a text file, then here is all of my writing for all of that particular month. So for if you're looking to develop as a writer or even just to reflect, it's really, really powerful. Steve, are we meant to be seeing your writing at, a, at the moment? Because all no. we see is the search and export. Oh, okay, oh, no, that's yeah. all right. So all it has is a, a huge selection. And then what I do is I throw that into OneNote. But does that help me with becoming a better writer? So the way that I use, I use an app called Hemingway app to make my writing a little bit better. So what you're going to do is you just simply paste your writing in here and then you'll notice that my current writing has a grade of nine and you've got all of these highlights and what you do is you click on it and you can edit it and what you're aiming to do is to reduce your grade to a lower, to lower writing. So what it's done for my personal writing is it's remove jargon so in education that's a bit complex because we're so much but it's made my writing simpler it means that you remove adjectives and you know superlatives and all those extra little bits and pieces that we do to sort of fluff up our writing and we just get to the point so that there are two ways that I look to build habits one is obviously writing every day and then the second is providing feedback on the pieces that I want to add to a blog post but what happens when you get stuck? Now I learned about this method the other day and this one is non-digital and it's called the MacGyver method. So if you're getting writer's block and you're stuck on an idea, what you do is you get this non-digital guy and you write it down on a piece of paper and you might write down, what is the through line for my presentation? And you'd be really, really specific about what you're trying to uncover. Then you put that card away. One minute. Then you get out and go for a walk for about 25 to 45 minutes. And what you want to do is to go for, the reason they say 25 to 45 is just so there's enough, enough distance for you to forget about that. And what happens is that little thing goes to the back of your mind, goes into your subconscious. It continues to work away and a little percolate. Then when you get back to your desk after your 25 to 45 minutes, you write down for five minutes, nonstop trying to answer that question. And within that five minutes, what you find is you come up with some really interesting insights into what you're trying to solve. So they're just a couple of strategies that I use to develop a habit, provide good feedback, and to work through writer's block. And you finish with 10 seconds to spare. Well done. And I know, Steve, you've been shooting out the blog posts at the moment. Every day is like another tag with another post. So it has been interesting. And I must admit, I haven't read all of them. But uh, I could see that you've been writing a lot. I don't know. Don't worry, I'll print them for you. And we can, you know, I can even Perfect. do reading. Perfect. I can't wait. I'll just put you in as like a podcast and you can read them to me to sleep. But um, I know that some of those ideas that you have shared do help because I know I'm one of those people who have a blog and my aim was one blog post a term and I don't think I've posted anything in about six months. So I know I've got about five working progress, but we also sometimes worry about making them perfect. And I think that the more you write, the more it sort of disappears that idea of having that perfect piece and, you know, nothing will ever be perfect. And sometimes you just have to publish it. Did anyone else have any comments or questions for Steve? Steve, hey. it sounds like 
this has been really helping you out a lot. I was just curious if with the, the Hemingway app, if you had any, any opportunity to use it with your students. I have a couple of students who I've selected it to use with, but it's interesting that some English teachers don't agree with the, the way that the app works. But I know that in particular, I can think of one student in my current year seven class who that has to be part of his tool suite because for him to be able to write sentences, you know, with, with his challenges, he needs all these systems. So he uses it for certain things, but yeah, it's interesting how some English teachers react to it. And is it free, Steve? Yes. Perfect. And works across all devices, just web-based? Just web-based, yep. Yeah. Perfect. Hey, yep. hey Steve. Um, awesome work and 100,000 words. That's like, that's like a doctoral thesis. So that, that's amazing work in six months. But uh, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say, um, you know, I've really enjoyed reading your posts, uh, you know, especially this year. So uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. I, it, I, when I heard there's a law called Sturgeon's Law, which means 90% of what you write or create will be crap. And then the 10% of it will be okay. So I'm happy with, with 10,000 being okay if, you know, I can deal with the other 90,000. Can I read some of them God? Oh my God, my five-year-old can do better than that. <laughs> oh, we all, we're always our worst critics, I think. Um, thank you, Steve. And it makes me want to be eager to read your next one now. So tomorrow I'll be reading it with no questions at all. Now, the next one, person we've got is another Steve. So, Steve, you'll be sharing gamification in the classroom. So, when you're ready, let me know and I will start the timer. Thanks. So, yeah, good to go. Perfect. Off you go. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. This is a real privilege for me, um, you know, getting to work with all you guys. And, uh, Steve, I just wanted to say that it's kind of – Funny that you talk about all that writing stuff because for me, that's been a big thing in my teaching career. I've always been into writing and uh, reading some stories and trying to bring into the imagination and stuff into the classroom. I guess that's sort of where my gamification journey started, wanting to bring um, you know, fictional worlds into the, into the class. And I used to have this little puppet in grade three when I started out named Scruffy. And the kids absolutely loved him to bits. But as I sort of pro progressed through and went to the higher levels, it had a similar effect, but not as much buy-in. So I was looking for something that could kind of help out with that. And gamification kind of has changed that and helped with it. So if you've never heard of gamification, Michael Matera is kind of the man to read up on. His books have been really, really helpful in um, finding out more information about it and really changed um, some of my lessons in the way that I teach. The way I see it, and I know like lots of people see it differently and can take different paths from it, but... If you have a lesson or a curriculum and you put gamification around it, a layer of it, then you can bring in any fictional world and try, uh, get the kids to buy into that. So what I thought I'd do is just sort of show a little bit of what I've been working on um, with the kids at our school. And the biggest change for me has been the introduction of G Suite uh, into our school. So getting the kids on the Google apps and using Google Classroom one to one and things like that. So uh, what I've done is sort of made all these little games. Uh, so I've got some original ones, the Imaginators, another one here, and then we've got a, a couple of themed ones, Pop Culture, which we're, we're doing this Avengers one at the moment with the kids where they um, become a part of the Avengers and they have to try and recruit uh, different characters. And how they do that is every lesson or a lesson here and there, we say it's worth a certain amount of experience points. And if they complete the lesson, they then can um, have enough experience points to get someone into their Avengers team, if you will. So uh, how it sort of works is once they have a look at the theme, so once you've created that theme, get the kids to choose like a team that they want to join and then they can apply uh, to actually join it. And what they do is they click on the team that they want to do. So for this one, if they wanted to be in the, the scientist class, so that team, they click on it, go to a form. And when they fill that form out, it will... I just can't see my screen at the top there. So... Um, yeah, so when they fill out the form, they'll actually get an email and that email will say that they've been successful in joining this team and then we give them a Google slide deck, which is kind of like their passport where they can uh, collect everything and bring it into their own, own sort of um, keepsake, if you will. So they can, they, as they go through uh, the term when we've got all the lessons, as they collect points, 
they can apply to get levels and badges. So that's how we kind of get the buy-in from the kids is that uh, not only are they learning, they're, they're getting minute. all these different things as well. Uh, and it's kind of hard to get that buy-in initially. Like you get a lot of kids that just sort of say, oh, this is just some silly game. But if you're kind of taking on that pirate philosophy of getting out of your comfort zone and just getting right into it, the kids really react to it. And we found that they, they are slowly starting to buy into it a lot. Um, and things like using Google Sheets to have the autocrat feature so they get that instant email back has really enhanced that engagement. So it's almost like they're not getting the stuff from the teachers, they're getting actual things come to their inboxes from fictional characters, if that makes sense. Uh, and yeah, that's about it, kind of how it sort of um, goes. But yeah, it's just been a huge change in, in my teaching in the sense that I remember having a, a professional and development session with someone and they said, one of the things you should look at is trying to put more oomph into your lessons and getting out of that comfort zone has really um, changed my teaching career, I suppose, and kind of got me into the position where I am now. Perfect. Thank you, Steve. That was great just to see how people are doing things differently. And I think the way to engage kids these days, sometimes teachers have to be creative in the way that we think of ways to um, capture and hold their attention. And I love seeing all the templates and everything. It just makes me wonder how much time that takes to put and how do you get the ideas? Like I would yeah, never well, thought of <laughs> Avengers. <laughs> <laughs> It's been a bit of 18 months in progress kind of thing and just playing around with it and investing a little bit of time. But yeah, it is starting to pay off very slowly. But yeah, taking that, that time, like with anything with technology, just slowly chipping away and learning different things and hearing from different teachers has been a huge help. Fantastic. Did anyone else have any questions or comments? Steve, when you... If you sorry, Mark. If Steve, if you were to start again... What would be the advice you'd have for people starting out? Because obviously 18 months, you, you would have learnt a lot yeah. along the way. What, what would be the sort of key things you'd say to, to people who are looking to start? Uh, I reckon it will work a lot better in your own classroom rather than as a specialist teacher with 200 kids. So I started with 200 kids trying to do it and trying to track their experience points or whatever you're kind of giving them was just about near on impossible. So yeah, start small and just test it and see how you go. <laughs> so don't jump in the deep end. No, nah. but you, doing that, you quickly find out what doesn't work as well. So it can be a positive on the flip side. Yeah, learn from your mistakes, but no, it's great. And Mark, you had a question? Yeah, I was just going to say a lot of teachers I know when they look at that kind of thing, they'd probably say, oh, that looks like way too much work to get set up. What would you say to them? Uh, I would say try not to go digitally. So I think the digital part of it has really enhanced the engagement, but you can also do it without all the digital stuff. Like you could make the badges or, uh, you know, Michael Matera's got heaps of ideas, particularly on his um, podcast and blog as well. So it doesn't have to go that digital way because, yeah, that can be very off-putting for someone who's um, not necessarily technical savvy but wants to get involved with playing the sort of gamification worlds within their classroom. I have to say too, Mark, I think Samantha, your colleague, um, she really, does she work for you, Samantha Verdinaga? Yeah, she do. Yeah, yeah, she does. She's been coming out to our school and PD us on stuff. And when she um, showed us Google Slides, it really changed um, how things were working with it all. So thanks, Sam, if you're watching. <laughs> Sam's great. Oh, I love Sam. She's always got great ideas and um, ways you can incorporate things. Adrian, did you have a question? Yes. Great work, Steve. Um, it reminds me a lot of the work by a guy named Lee Sheldon. Um, he wrote this awesome book called The Multiplayer Classroom. Are you familiar with that? No, I'm not, but I'm going to write that down and go and have a look at it. Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, check it out. It's awesome. Yeah, cool. Perfect. Well, on that note, Adrian, you're actually next up. So thank you, Steve. And Adrian, you're going to be sharing using industry standard CAD or CAD to design Formula One racing cars. And I know the other night you and I had a chat on the phone and when you said, what do I share? And I said, anything. And you said this, I am super excited to see what this actually entails because you always have a few things that blow my mind with the way your brain thinks. So um, let me know when you're ready and I'll start the timer. Um, yeah, good to go. Perfect. All right. Um, Thanks. So uh, I was asked to share a, a tool or an idea, and, and I guess it got me thinking to uh, some of the things that I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about STEM, but I'm really passionate about manufacturing technologies as well. 
and I've been working with 3D printers for 10 years and picking up on what Mark said um, about, you know, people going off and buying a 3D printer and then, you know, printing out a few trinkets that they download and, and then not being able to work with it um, sort of breaks my heart a little bit because I think there's so many interesting things that you can do um, provided students have a real context. And one of those things is, um, I guess, I, I still teach a class as part of my role. I teach a year eight class. It's an elective. It's called F1 in schools. It's a project-based uh, elective that runs over, over a semester. Um, there is no uh, ass assessment. The assessment is the product or the, or the outcome at the end. And basically, students are given a design brief to go and design a manufacture, uh, and, and manufacture a Formula One racing vehicle um, based on some based on some design considerations. And so this takes what I think is like a lot of the popular simplistic computer aided design software packages like Tinkercad um, to the next level, where you're, really, um, where you're really using an industry standard bit of software. So SolidWorks is what we use. SolidWorks is the same computer aided design um, package that uh, companies like Boeing and Ferrari use to manufacture their, their aircraft and, and, their, and their cars. Um, so we get students to come in, they learn a few uh, basic skills and then they're off on their own. So they design and manufacture a Formula One racing car, as you can see on the screen. They create um, a, an assembly. So basically they add uh, some axles and some wheels. They create some photorealistic renders of their car. Then they um, run themselves through some um, uh, computational fluid dynamics or some um, wind tunnel type testing, some virtual wind tunnel type testing, um, a branch of mathematics called finite element analysis to, to test the structural integrity of their designs. And this is all sort of mathematics and, and engineering principles that they wouldn't normally encounter until probably third year of university, but they can access it in a, in a relatively easy way, um, even at year eight, because they have a real context and a real interest and a real passion in, in producing a product that, that works. So once they, once they design their car, they put it through some testing, then they're up to manufacturing. So they manufacture their car out of balsa wood um, using a CNC router, um, which is a subtractive manufacturing technology. They also use additive manufacturing technologies like 3D printers to, to design different wheel systems and then combine that with um, different bearings and, and to really sort of get into the physics behind um, uh, Formula One and how to make their cars go faster. They produce a twenty. They produce a twenty-page portfolio um, where they where they look at all their design um, uh, elements and they bring it all together. Where they design a, a team name, they design a logo, um, they go out and generate sponsorship, and then at the, the culminating event is they actually man an exhibition booth, a three by three meter exhibition booth, where they create all their own posters, all their own materials, and all their own advertising to really showcase the car that they've made. And then obviously they then race their cars along an elevated 20 meter track. Um, and the cars are powered by little CO2 canisters. And you know, some of those cars just hurtle down the track and travel that 20 meters in, in less than a second. Um, so it's an awesome sort of uh, context for learning. It combines computer added design, it combines 3D printing, creativity, problem solving, um, and kids just, um, kids love it. So. Thank you. Perfect, with four seconds to go. Now, I've got a quick question. Um, I'm seeing this as, and I know Geelong is both boys and girls. Do you have many girls buy into this elective? Uh, <laughs> we have a few girls from time to time, but unfortunately it is, it is dominated by, by boys. Um, so for instance, I've got, I usually have a, a, full, a full class each semester and you know, 25 students or so, and typically, 23 of those are boys. We do get a couple of girls each semester. So I am trying to work quite hard with the girls and encourage them to get, get involved more. But yeah, definitely boys, uh, boys snap I up. can definitely see why they would. It looks like a fantastic sort of task for the term for them to work on. So thank you for sharing. I'm pretty sure other people will have questions. Steve especially, I can see his little head bobbing around. So off you go, Steve. <laughs> Look, it's, it's so refreshing to hear people talk about 3D printing not as a plug and play technology because there's so much that you need to invest in terms of training and understanding how to service it and all of that. And also to actually embed it in curriculum and give it purpose. Um, so what I, I guess my question is, 
for kids who are quite advanced in Tinkercad, what's, how big a jump is it to SolidWorks? Uh, it, it's, it's a jump, but it, it's got a relatively low entry level so they can get in and, and experience some success quite easily. And I think some of the flow and effects of actually working with an industry standard package like SolidWorks or Katia or any of those um, you know, industry standard CAD packages is that not only are they learning design principles, they're also um, learning sophisticated mathematical concepts. They're learning to work in three dimensions. They're learning you know, the Cartesian coordinate system. They're, they're learning about geometry and, and all these different um, elements that sort of have flow and effects through, through the curriculum. You know, there's properties and materials in science and um, you know, there's, there's literacy because there's high levels of literacy as they're learning about new terminology and then applying things that they're learning as they go. So um, to answer your question, I guess there's, there's a bit of a jump but it does have a relatively low entry level. So they can get in, experience some success, but then they do have to invest the time um, to, to really elevate um, their, their designs to the next level. So for instance, um, the, the, the cars that the kids design, uh, their first iteration of their design will typically take about 10 weeks. Um, and that's 10 weeks solid um, using, using the software. Wow. Any other questions or comments? Um, yeah, what, um, Adrian, do you have any tips for trying to get this stuff going in a primary school? Like any, any tips? Is it, is it possible? Like where do we start? Because I know we've got a lot of people that talk about 3D printers in primary schools, but whether it's viable or not, that's something that's hard to convince people to, to go with. Um, yeah, it's, it's absolutely viable. So we typically start our year fives off in Tinkercad, getting them used to working geometrically, dragging out shapes and changing the dimensions, um, designing a few, simple, a few simple objects and then learning about the 3D printing process. But very quickly, I think probably by about term two of each year, we move them onto SolidWorks. And so we're actually introducing SolidWorks at year five um, and then having it run right through, right through our school, right through to year 12. To, to the senior design and visual arts students. Um, but in a primary school setting, I, I think it's just about um, creating some interesting context and getting kids designing things. Um, you know, kids ultimately will want to jump onto Thingiverse or some sort of uh, central repository where people can upload their designs and then they'll download them and print them out. And, and I guess that's okay. Um, but, you know, I think the next level is getting them to, to really start thinking creatively and, and designing something to solve a problem as opposed to just designing, um, you know, something that doesn't mean anything. Cool. Perfect. Well, we've got last up on today's show, we have got Emily and Emily, your title of your session has got me wondering. It's simply epic. So I'm, I'm just wondering what, a, what on earth are you sharing? So I'll throw over to you and when you're ready, let me know and we can start the timer. Okay, well, there's been some pretty epic presentations already today. Um, thanks, guys. That's been really great. Um, so what I'm going to be sharing today is um, epic books for kids. Um, and a lot of our schools have really great libraries, and we're not able to bring all of those books into our classrooms. So Epic is an online library with more than 15,000 books um, and has books by some of your favorite authors, um, such as Eric Carle with his Very Hungry Caterpillar and Melanie Watts' his Scaredy Squirrel. Um, it's got hundreds of fiction and nonfiction books, and it is an absolutely free resource for educators to use in their classrooms. Um, and I'll explain more about that later. And it's um, primarily geared at the elementary level. So available online on any desktop or laptop and as an app in the Android and Apple store. So it has some audiobooks, it has educational videos, it has collections of books around themes, um, it has high interest books for those reluctant readers. They are constantly adding new editions and there's such a wide range of books um, that you can use it in any curriculum. So to get started, you just go to uh, getepic.com educators. It's as simple as clicking the get started button and they will help you get started with a teacher profile. And then from there, you will set up your student profiles. Now there is a new feature to import right from Google Classroom, which is great if you have that, um, makes it a little bit quicker. And then um, you might not be able to see right now, but there's also a class code there that um, will make it really easy for your students to log in. 
Um, so when the, what the teacher sees is they'll see um, some statistics about how many books their class has read, how many hours they've been uh, reading, watching videos, things like that. And you'll be able to actually see and edit each individual um, student's profile. So you'll be able to access their reading log um, individually um, or as also by a whole class. Um, and then you can enable the home access. But again, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later when we get to parents. Um, so you can see who's reading what um, and how long they're reading it for. Uh, you can create quizzes. So if you have a book club, you can create a quiz and send it out for those books um, for those students to do. And then also you can assign a collection of books. So if you're doing a unit about plants, you as the teacher can go in, gather up all those books and push them out to the students. Now for the students, they'll see those cute little kids at the bottom. Um, click on those to log in and that's where they enter their, their um, sign in access code to make it really quickly for them. Um, they'll find their little monster as the profile and then they'll come to this page here. This is where they will be able to browse um, the featured collections, books that are recommended specifically towards their interest, um, videos, and a few other things. They'll find the book that they love to read and just jump right in and it is, they've got some really great books here. Um, as you can see, the quality of the books are beautiful with illustrations, um, easy to read books. Um, and so they can just continue reading on through. Um, if they really love this book a lot, um, they'll be able to go in up to the little hamburger there and favorite that book. So it goes into their own um, library. It's been added there. And then if they go into my library, they'll be able to see um, all the books and videos that they've already favorited, as well as the recent books, which is really great if they want to go back to a book, pick up right where they left off, and they can continue reading. One minute. Okay. Um, there's a search option. They can search by keyword, title, or author. Um, there's also the advanced search for age or um, levels, which is really great for finding just right books and for fiction and nonfiction books. Um, we'll just click on the book here. You'll be able to see that there's the option for playing um, in the top right corner, as well as doing a quiz, um, which is just a multiple choice quiz. So for educators, there's a resource page. Um, it gives you um, support to help get you set up, a letter for parents, and some great tips on how to use this within your classroom. Um, and then for parents, now, like I said, you can enable this for home, but this is how the company makes their money. Uh, it's $7.99, I think it's US a month, um, and it's up to four profiles, so if you have four kids, um, you can access this. It's completely up to you as a school if you choose to enable that feature or not. Um, we chose not to and just use it as an in-class resource um, for read-alouds, um, uh, read to your buddy, things like that. And that is Epic uh, Digital Library bringing thousands of books into your classroom. Emily, that was amazing. I know I was having a chat to my librarian the other day and a lot of these audio books and online text costs an arm and a leg. So um, to find something free is absolutely fantastic. One thing that I do know that is coming up a lot, can, are any of the texts aligned to like reading levels? I don't know what you're used to, but like PM or Fontes and Pinal reading levels? Um, they don't have those particular two, but I think it was AR um, Lexel and there was something else in there that you could um, do it to, but you have the reading ages, which is, is really important. Yeah, so if perfect. the students are um, reading above, they can always find books that are eight to 10 instead of five to seven. Yep, and you said, as you said, it was free, completely free for Absolutely students to use in class. If you're using it in your classroom during the class day. As soon as the kids try to access it at home after hours, it'll ask for the teacher password, which is why then the parents have to, to log in and do that and pay if they want to use it at home. So Perfect. again, cool if they want to enable that home access. Perfect. That is one I'm definitely getting because you can never have enough text, especially being in an inquiry school, as you know. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I just agree how good it is. We, we started using it recently. Uh, one of our teachers found it really cool and it's spread throughout the school really, really fast in popularity. So it's, it's awesome. I, I guess I'd pipe in as well and just say that uh, I call this kind of like a barn door for teachers. This is one of those apps that, you know, a lot of those teachers that have got iPads or Chromebooks in the classroom and they're just gathering dust. And if you can just find that one thing that they go, wow, that looks pretty cool, I'll, I'll actually start using that. That's what I've found in, in my kind of experience. If you can get them onto Epic, then they suddenly, suddenly start to get the fact that this digital tool can open up a whole world for them. It's just, it's one of those really good apps for that. Well, I've actually used it with my daughter at home as a parent and found it for, you know, obviously 
she loves reading and then she reads the readers and she rereads them. But when it gets time to sort of finding books that she's interested in about space and, and other things, it's just really powerful. Um, so for any parents out there, it's well worth the spend. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you guys for all sharing that. I must say another fantastic show of Teach Tech Play. I feel sorry for the viewers out there to vote for their play king or queen. I'll just share my screen again. Make sure you do check out our website with all up-to-date information there regarding the upcoming conference where we'll be posting some interesting presenters very soon as well as um, all the previous recorded web shows and blog posts and it allows you to connect with a range of educators and as I said Emily will be at our Teach Tech Play conference next year along with a few of the other presenters that we did have on today's show so make sure that you do check it out um, and get your tickets soon before they all sell out because it's li the lineup is getting better and better but I can't spoil it yet because it's not ready to be released but keep an eye out and that will be coming in the next few months as soon as I find a free weekend um, and have time to put it all together but um, that it brings us to the end of the show and I just wanted to say a huge thank you again to all of our yeah. presenters for sharing some amazing tools and ideas that people can take back to either their school, their classroom, or a friend who is a teacher. Um, and yeah, make sure you vote. If you've got a question, reach out to us on Twitter. We're always there to help. And we look forward to seeing you all soon. So thank you guys and tune in for next episode of episode 35 in November. Thanks guys. Bye.